Okay, welcome to our roundtable discussion. If you're joining us live, you can put questions in on the Facebook post right below the stream, and we'll try to get to them at the end or throughout, we'll see. Um, and I'm glad everyone joined us. My name's Jill. I'm with Simplify Homeschool to College. I run that with my partner, Farah. Um, who's totally awesome and joining us today. We also run this Facebook group, College Confident Homeschoolers. So if you're here, you know where it is. If you're watching this somewhere else, please join us. We'd love to have you. We have 4,000 members and it's a lot of great parents and a lot of great people giving advice. You can ask questions. We're always there to answer. So we'd love to have you there. I am also joined by two amazing people, Holly Ramsey, and Rebecca Stewart Orlowski. And I'm gonna let everyone um, introduce themselves. We're all, we all homeschooled our own children um, and we all work in college admissions and a lot of, we all specialize in homeschoolers and others. I know we don't just do homeschoolers. All right, Farah, why don't you start us off? Uh, so I'm Farah Williams and I'm Jill's partner. And uh, so I'm also with Simplify Homeschool. Um, you can uh, always find us uh, here in College Confident Homeschoolers and um, we're uh, e easily found here at <laughs> Simplify Homeschool. Um, and uh, I'm a former classroom uh, teacher and then I homeschooled my kids and I liked it so much that now I just want to work with homeschoolers professionally forever <laughs> uh, and have been uh, doing this, helping uh, homeschoolers uh, get into college for uh, like about five years now, I think. Um, and so it's a joy. We'll talk a little bit about trends. I am Rebecca okay, Stewart for love. Oh, sorry about that. Do it. <laughs> Do so it. Good. Go ahead. I'm Go just for going it. around the clock. Okay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I am Rebecca Stewart Orlowski, uh, Orlowski College Consulting LLC here in uh, sunny San Diego. I think all of us are all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, I am uh, finishing my 11th year of college consulting. I also was a, a classroom teacher. I also just finished 25 years of private homeschooling, uh, three of my children. I have a 29-year-old, 26-year-old, and an 18-year-old. Um, yeah, I specialize, obviously, in homeschooling. It's what I know and love, but I work with transfer students, twice exceptional students. Um, I love musical students and, um, and then just kids on unusual paths. I find that I work with a lot of kids who come from non-traditional backgrounds. So on to you, Holly. Hi, everybody. I'm Holly Ramsey of Thoughtful Homeschooling. I'm homeschool mom emeritus of five kids, 20 plus years, three states, and have been doing this professionally, uh, I guess, since 2017. I have another hat I wear in that I also coach online writing classes for Brave Writer. So love working with teen writers and do that across a variety of settings. And then I'm doing some writing myself. So a colleague and I are going to be publishing a book, should be out early in 2024, uh, College Unmazed Homeschool Edition. That's awesome. <laughs> so, yes. So that's going to be geared toward parents navigating this whole process that I think we're going to spend the next many minutes talking about. So delighted to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I think my internet's a little laggy, so if that pops up, Farah, you'll have to take over if anything okay. happens. So I'm just putting that out there. It was just a little weird for a minute. Um, I'm Jill. Like I said, I've been homeschooling my children since they were very little. If you're in College Confident Homeschoolers, you know that. You may even know um, my oldest son, Trufo, who's done a live discussion there on college and disabilities. Um, I like to work with students who have learning disabilities or physical disabilities. It's very close to my heart because of my own family. The reason I homeschooled was um, because my twins were born prematurely and they had some issues. And I find homeschooling works really well with that student population. I also like working with music kids. I have a lot of music kids, um, gifted kids, twice exceptional. That's all in our wheelhouse. But we do homeschoolers because we love homeschoolers. We love homeschooling and we do other students too. So I'm glad everyone's here. I think everyone just wants us to get started. So let's talk about big picture things, all right? So COVID came, we've all been doing this for at least before COVID, right, mm -hmm. started. And then COVID came, it changed things a little bit. Things are settling now. What are all of you seeing in homeschool admissions? Noticing any trends, anything that's changed recently? 
anything parents should be looking out for? What's everyone's take on that? Um, Becca, you want to start us since you've been doing this the longest? Oh, golly. I guess there are a couple of trends. Um, I would say mostly positive and perhaps the one that I, I don't know what the trend will continue to be, but this last cycle I saw maybe a, a, a negative trend. Um, so I would say the positive trends are just simply that homeschooling is accepted widely at colleges. Parents, um, you know, who come in and and worry about homeschooling high school. They just think that homeschoolers can't get into college. And as we all know, that that's just not true. So I think by and large colleges mm -hmm. are very homeschool friendly. Many colleges have homeschool, uh, you know, specific language on their website. So I think that's a really positive uh -huh. trend. Um, I would say the one trend that I noticed from my own students and maybe from, um, I, I co-moderate um, a group here in California called California Homeschool yeah. College Seekers. And I would say in that group as well, um, that that's the University of California. I feel like my homeschoolers did not do quite as well mm -hmm. as they have in the past. Now, UCs, University of California, Historically, like years and years ago, they were sort of homeschool unfriendly, and then they kind of got on board. They really understood it. They really, you know, they have a they have a holistic admissions practice, um, and then they went test blind, which you know, in some ways, made it a little bit harder for homeschoolers, but in other ways, it, it was still fine. So, but I would say this year in particular, and I I don't have the reasons why um, I'm going to be attending a UC conference this fall. Um, I feel like they didn't do as well overall. Now, I mean, I had students admitted to every UC, um, you know, and Berkeley seems to really love homeschoolers. I always have multiple homeschoolers admitted to Berkeley, but um, it was a little bit wonky and it just could be everybody yeah. felt it, not yeah. just homeschoolers, you know. You know, so. I noticed that this year too. I actually noticed that this year too. And my um, oldest son applied to the UCs. He's 24 now, so maybe about, five years ago um, and just was accepted everywhere, right? Every UC lo loved him. And this year I was surprised. I was noticing it with homeschoolers that the UCs were a little tougher this year. And I'm not sure what the reasons are either. Yeah. Right. And it could, could have been specific majors, you know, I, you yeah. know, obviously computer science is always just excruciating no matter where you're applying. But um, yeah, it was super interesting. I mean, I still had, I think I have, you know, I had five or six of my homeschoolers admitted to Berkeley, but, you know, right. it's always that uneven um, for most students, you know, you're admitted to Berkeley, but not to UCSD, you know, not to yeah. UC Irvine, things like that. And of course, yeah. you know, last year I had, you know, crazy uh, admitted to Stanford, but waitlisted at Riverside. So right. <laughs> that was <a> <laughs> But yes. yeah, but we'll see where the trend goes. I'm really curious about, you know, this year's um, homeschoolers and the University of California. Right. Yeah, I'll be watching that, too. OK, Holly, what do you what have you been seeing? Well, maybe just to broaden that out slightly, I'm San Antonio based and I do have some kids applying to UCs every year, but it's not it's not a huge part of, of a lot of my right. college list. But what I'm seeing broadly, I think, is, you know, these smaller private uh, institutions are very adept at reading homeschoolers and have a lot of flex in them. Most of the bigger public institutions are okay at it, but every so often, I think we run up against the bureaucracy in a, mm -hmm. in a larger public institution. So sometimes there can be some translation issues there that have the potential to be problematic. And I know, Farah, I know you're you're working with UMass Amherst to try to get them on uh, yeah uh, 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 to come to the to see the light when it comes to right uh, <laughs> I tried I don't know that they listened <laughs> right uh well you know I so I do see that occasionally with my homeschoolers oftentimes though what I'm discovering is so much of it is is reaching the right person mm -hmm. uh to find a way around an impact yeah. So one thing I just would like to encourage homeschool parents with is maybe try a little harder to vet the person who answers the phone when you call an institution, because <laughs> what you're going to find is you're probably getting an hourly student worker who may be very helpful and trying to answer your question. Mm -hmm. They may not be the person you need to speak to. And, and, and even right. if you admission officer at 
at plenty of these colleges, they have a dedicated homeschool reader. Not all of them, but plenty of them do. So sometimes even another admission officer may give you an answer that is really outside of their area of expertise. So I would just yes. encourage parents to keep asking the question and make sure you're talking to someone who actually reads a lot of homeschoolers. Because I think what my clients find is sometimes the bite of what is officially stated on a university page is different from the reality and that there actually is more flex for your particular situation. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, just don't give up and, and don't necessarily stop with the first person you speak to. You, you know, that's funny. I was just talking to a client and she's looking at schools here in Virginia. And one of the schools just changed their policy online for homeschoolers. They just put it up. Like that said homeschoolers like a yeah. week ago. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Said that homeschoolers are no longer test optional. So she called in to ask about this because her daughter wants to go in and they're like, nope, that's the policy. But then she called back to talk to someone else. They're like, that's absolutely not the policy at all. They're not sure why it's officially on the site. She's like, what do I do with this? I'm like, we need something in writing because I mean, calling is good too, but sometimes you need it in writing. So we're following up with that because Jill, we don't I know. Have, I have a question yeah. about that though. Is your, okay. is your student planning on applying test optional? Yes, they are. Because so here's here's the thing about that, right? Chapman University. Now, granted, this the major that my student was going for was, you know, film. So very selective. Right. But right. we went back and forth with Chapman because they have a policy, you know, that uh, homeschoolers need to submit test scores. But my student, you know, had uh, bunches of community college classes, straight A, mm -hmm. I mean, just mm -hmm. stellar student. Um, and, you know, she contacted admissions, they said it was fine, you know, okay, no test score, but she wasn't admitted. Now, it could have been her major, but I'm suspicious of Chapman, and I will always recommend that my homeschoolers have test scores. So in the case of this school, you know, I guess she might be the guinea pig, unfortunately, because even though yeah. that one person said, no, that's absolutely not our policy, well, it's on your website. So that's a really, yeah. I guess that's something for all of us and our homeschool families to be aware of is, right. you know, even if this person said that's, you know, no, no, the, you, you know, consider, you don't know, possible, right? right, you know, yeah. if you're going to that school or just know, know what you're up against, I guess. Yeah. I, yeah. I feel like you have to ask, you know, this is why it's still, you know, word of mouth is still kind of important in the homeschool world. Like. I mean, you do need to hear, I mean, that's one of the things I appreciate in our group is people are like, well, has anybody applied to this school? Has anybody, you know, was this really the policy? I mean, Jill and I've worked with lots of students who've been really successful test optional um, mm -hmm. and it, it, like a lot of homeschoolers. And so I don't, I don't worry about it in a general sense. I think a lot of families still have a sort of knee jerk, but not for homeschoolers. We can never... I'm like, no, no, no. I've seen homeschoolers get into really selective schools, test optional, like it absolutely can happen. But there are these individual schools where they're not, where they'll say it's test op, but it's not really. And then there's the other end where like, you know, when I was going around this summer um, and stopped in um, at uh, Quinnipiac, you know, not a super selective school, though they do have a few, you know, more selective programs like nursing and PA. But like, you know, and, and she said, well, we're not test optional for homeschoolers. And then she goes, but you just ask and we'll waive it. And I was like, so it's not a real policy. Like it's not even, you know, so it's like at both of these ends where, you know, and I've had that happen before at other schools yeah. where we call and talk to someone and, and it's like, well, the student has, you know, all this, you know, dual enrollment and all of it, you know, has these AP scores and, and they're like, oh, that was fine. Yeah, sure. They can apply test optional, you know, and they're clearly, and then they get in and it's, so it's clearly like, ah, it's very frustrating <laughs> because I think they don't know. They don't know what their policy is sometimes. Um, and you like know, you I said, the that. guinea pig. Yeah, yeah. and I had that, it, not, a, not the same situation, but this was two cycles ago, maybe. I had a student who really wanted to go to Bard. And uh -huh. um, I won't recommend just, for your listeners out there, until I see a clear policy change, I'm not going to recommend BARD to my homeschoolers. Now, maybe you guys have not experienced this, but um, they made my parent, I mean, uh, she worked hours and hours and hours with me. She's paying money to me to help develop uh, syllabi 
for every non-accredited course. They wanted to see that. She had 40 pages of oh, documentation. So and I, I encountered um, the head of BARD admissions at a, at a conference. And I said, do you, do you know what's happening? And she said, oh, gosh, well, I'll talk to them when I get back. But I don't believe that the language ever changed. I don't believe that it did. Right. And, you know, and the student, that was her number one choice. So we did it. Um, so, you know, and, and we asked, she asked, she called them and she said, sure, we're fine. We want, you know, 40 pages is fine. And this is barred, which <laughs> seems to be a really, you know, quote unquote, out of the box. So there are, like I right. said, there are those just anomalies, but it really impacts, um, you know, who I'm going to recommend, you know, what, what uh -huh. colleges I'll recommend now. And for our, I mean, I do have a student going to UMass, a homeschooled student, Yeah, but <laughs> he checks, you know, the boxes, right, yep. of, mm -hmm. you know, having the X number of dual enrollment and all of that. And it, it's a great school. And, and it's unfortunate that they've, you know, held so fast on that. It's, it's so, I mean, I feel like there's almost, there's, I feel like there's two trends that are happening at the same time. Like on the one hand, we had more students this year into big, super competitive state flagships, you know, like Chapel Hill and Georgia Tech and stuff than we have had in the past. Um, and so I feel like some of these schools, state schools, these big institutions have gotten homeschool friendlier. And the same thing with like the SUNY schools, which used to be kind of a no-go seem to be now, like, you know, kids who got into Stony Brook and are gonna be matriculating and stuff. So I'm hearing, you know, so that this is this one trend, but then on the other hand, you've got UMass and then you've got this Virginia school that we're talking about, like you know, adding back the test po policy, like just for homeschoolers and, you know, some of the, so it feels to me like there's sort of two things happening. One where some schools are getting less homeschool friendly and one where homeschool some schools are getting more homeschool friendly. Oh, and Jill's internet went out. So that's, <laughs> well, we and lost I think our that's, host. <laughs> that's what's so frustrating for parents, right? Because mm -hmm. especially you know, I, I think many people have a tendency to generalize their particular situation. Sorry. Hey, welcome back, Jill. So, I don't know what happened. <laughs> so I think a lot of times, you know, they talk to their friends and maybe their friend was at the Bard or maybe, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and so then all of a sudden, we as consultants are trying to put out these rumors that, oh, no, you must have 40 pages of documentation or you won't get into college. And like, right. No, 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 that was one particular situation. So I think just, you know, another word of caution to parents is be discerning. Understand when we talk about the college admissions process, we are talking about 4,000 different processes. And you don't have to master all of them, but if you put some work up front in making sure like you have a document package that will work anywhere, then it becomes a little bit easier to navigate that process. But I think so much stress is caused by someone generalizing a particular. And we just have to really yeah. caution ourselves, you know, as consultants and as, as parents, especially as parents, just against that. Uh, I think that's true in Facebook groups too. Like I noticed that in our Facebook group, right? I mean, like one parent will say one thing and then everyone jumps on that. And then they all stress about it. And we're like, no, no, take a step back. It's okay. This is just one person's experience. Well, and then also it's the, it's the case that, you know, a lot of what we're doing and you know what we're, we're trying to advise people against is to just to be aware we're talking about like really selective schools right now mm -hmm. i mean even something like bard is you know they're kind of selective at least and so you you know some of the stuff that we're saying well you should think about this sometimes doesn't matter if you're going to go to you know your second tier public and i think everybody needs to remember that like you you don't have to necessarily do all of the things <laughs> Um, right. So, yeah. And then you have to decide if it, I mean, everything's a case by case and families, right? Like your student really wanted to go to Bard, right? So they're willing to do all that. Sure. Well, I, I have to put in though, I had a student this, this year who, uh, it was, it was their second choice, uh, didn't end up picking it, but, um, yeah. not, did not submit that much paperwork and got in. So you just never, that's well, the maybe, frustrating maybe thing. They up Updated the website. Maybe they updated the person who they were. I, I told I told the family to ignore it, 
and I thought they'd get in and, and she did. I mean, she had some other, you know, so, I mean, again, it could be individual, so it's hard to know, but. Well, yeah, if they got on board, that's great. I'll, I mean, I'll she did commit, submit course descriptions and, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it depends if it's your top pick, you're going to do everything just for yep. it because you really uh -huh. want to go. Yeah. And it wasn't that person's top, top pick. No. Um, so then let's talk about paperwork though, then, you know, that's a big discussion in our homeschool group. And sometimes I think there was a post recently where someone's like, you don't need course descriptions for any school at all. That's not necessary. Don't do that. And other people are like, no, you should do that. Right. You should have all this basic paperwork. I know Farah and I feel that paperwork is very important for homeschoolers and it can only benefit the student when applying because it, it gives a bigger picture and a more thorough picture of what's going on. What does everyone feel about homeschooling? I mean, I mean the paperwork specifically and do homeschoolers need it? Does it help them? Do you work on all that with your uh, clients? Holly, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I absolutely think it benefits uh, homeschoolers to thoroughly yet concisely explain. Uh -huh. their I love that. Concise. And mm -hmm. what I find, why I work with parents to make sure they have their four core docs, the transcript, course description, mm -hmm. school profile, and counselor letter. We put that in place first because usually when a parent comes to me, they don't yet know for certain what their student's college list is going to be. Uh -huh. So, okay, great. Let's say your kid only applies to A&M, which takes the SRAR, and you're going to have to self-report your classes. Well, even then, you're still going to have to submit a final transcript, and it better match the mm -hmm. self-report. Yeah. But very rarely do parents and students have a set-in-stone college list at the point when it's appropriate to create their documentation. So I want them to be prepared for any school at all. And if an admission officer doesn't look at it, okay, fine. But if they have a question, let's make sure we have clear, concise, compelling, very scannable documents where that person can quickly find an answer to their question. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really curious too. I don't know if you all have started to think about it. I don't want to change the question, you know, everyone. No, it's fine. Go ahead. Feel free to answer that one. <laughs> but, uh, what I'm wondering about lately, and this is based on a conversation I just had with Liam Daly, who's the homeschool reader for Beloit. I was talking to him this week and he's like, you know, hey, just heads up, Slate now has capability where AI is summarizing the counselor letters. Uh, so, you know, we don't basically like, officers don't necessarily have to read the whole counselor letter. AI right. is doing that. So, you know, I'm just beginning and I don't feel like I quite yet have, I don't know, even the vocabulary or, or the pegs in my brain for everything related to AI. But I do think, you know, that's going to have an impact too. On that's going to have an impact. Yeah. On how we present these documents. I'm just not quite sure what that impact is yet it's that's interesting okay Farrah, do you have thoughts on that or the original question i mean i have thoughts about the a i mean i do too <laughs> i mean one of the things that's you know obviously like you know us when we're working with a family i mean we're helping them craft these documents um and we have experience but with you know, with families who aren't hiring us, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad tool to, you know, to get a structure for your counselor letter or particularly for your course descriptions. Um, and you can kind of, I, I've played with it to see, I've played with chat GPT and, and, uh, Bard to see how they, to see how they do it. Um, and if you, you know, if you, if you just aren't sure how to write it up, you know, you can tell it, I want, just one paragraph and I want that, you know, I want it to include this information and this was the textbook and here's a couple of the things we did and here's the, and you can put it in your own language and it, it'll give it to you in a nice point. Like, so I think that's nice. That's interesting. I saw that that was coming like some somewhere else too, that, that they were going to be using it to interpret the documents. I'm wondering mm -hmm. like, maybe we should start feeding it through. I mean, I've been thinking that we should be using bullet points more because in the That's past, we've, yeah. we've, we've leaned towards more narrative, but I've, you know, I think I've, I mean, I've heard from, from other admissions officers that they like the, the bullet points. 
Yeah, um, I encourage that in my counselor letter. Yeah. I mean, there is some narrative, but I definitely encourage bullet mm -hmm. points and it, based on what I've- But I think pushing it more, I think it's, you know, it's been- Becca, so what do you Holly, think? You've, you've switched over to bullet points only for your counselor so, letters? Not only, not only, but they're up toward the, so in the top third. So usually my people have a short chunk at the beginning and then we have right. those key bullet points and then some more narrative. Mm -hmm. because I feel like if someone's really engaged, maybe they'll read the whole page. That would be awesome. Uh, but if they don't, by golly, they better know these five things about my students. So, so narrative, bullet points, narrative. That's just how I tend to yeah. encourage yeah. families to structure it. Um, and, and, you know, I tend to find that the families want to write longer than they probably should. So uh -huh. <laughs> sometimes just helping them understand that a typical admissions office maybe will spend 15 minutes, but very often you're going to have two maybe minutes. it's going yeah. to be four to seven minutes on the mm -hmm. entire application. So if it's that long on the entire application, we need to get to the point here on the parent side. You got you you need to discern what is most important. And I find that's where parents can often use some help because when you're so close to the situation everything seems so important. Right. So really helping them just discern what is that, what is that through line that we have to make sure really sings? That's what I focus on. Becca, how do you approach that with parents? Uh, yeah, so in Ashley, I, I do it a little bit different in terms of, I do transcripts and course descriptions in one document. Now you okay. can separate them easily, you know, yeah. so for families, you know, who might not know, but, you know, if you're applying to the common application, the parent is the counselor and there are four slots for transcripts or whatever documents you want. So, um, you know, so I do the, you know, the transcript with course description, counselor letter, school profile, but um, for some students, I also have them develop a reading list and I've had parents upload that there as well especially for those kids who are prolific readers, or it, mm -hmm. it would be a benefit to see sort of what they're reading, not just in, you know, their classes, but also just on their own. Um, yeah, succinctness can be very difficult <laughs> for we parents. <laughs> Um, okay. And I'm, you know, I think Holly brings up a good point about AI. I'm, I am pretty old school, um, but I, you know, I think for me, um, Anytime that they have, anytime that parents have questions, I really encourage communicating with admissions offices. Yes, we know that you're not, you know, always going to get the same answer from two people, but I, I give the right. example of years ago. I mean, this is when my first eldest son was applying to college. We had a transcript and course descriptions that was about 22 pages long. And so I contacted Princeton because that was one of the schools on his list. And they were kind, but they sort of, you know, said, oh, well, that's fine. But if you can get it shorter, that's great. So we got it down to 15 pages because he, you know, he was very academically robust. And so, you know, he was admitted later. But so that's what I tell my families that often. I'm like, you know, let's be succinct. Um, you know, sometimes a family will list, you know, the books down like bullet point list and it, that right. one course description has taken a whole page. I'm like, no, you should be able to get like three course descriptions or four <laughs> on one page. So that's, you know, definitely something I encourage. And the counselor letter, you know, as Holly pointed out, I am still narrative. You know, the bullet point doesn't feel right for most of my families because there right. are circumstances. I guess I'm, you know, uh, you know, with my own children, like it was just really important context. You know, uh, Rick Clark, the head of admissions at Georgia Tech just posted a brilliant blog. I'm sure you all follow him. I just adore his blogs. But, um, you know, I, I was just kind of interacting with him and just context is super important. So we can really be succinct parents, but um, there are points of contact you know, context, like with my middle son, you know, what was the reason he didn't take AP exams or whatever, right. you know, it's like, those were really important. Now, did they read it? I don't know, but I personally would rather have it there and let them be the determining factor whether or not they read it, you know, and the thing that we can't control is who, which college is going to read what, you know, I think in right. the past year I heard, oh, well, Pomona doesn't even look at the counselor letter, but they want to see a school profile. And then I've heard this school looks at, you know, the counselor letter, but not the school right. profile. We just don't know. 
So we want to give them all, you know, and I really like for school profile, I've had parents, you know, just go on and on listing the qualifications of every teacher. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, that's your choice, you know, but right. I like a two page school profile. I like a two to three page counselor letter. I know most people say one, but I think two to three yeah. is good. And then I do, you know, if we can keep the course descriptions, you know, um, I, again, it just depends on how how many courses that student took. Like my younger right. one, non-academic. And in fact, I kept all that those records, but I only submitted the regular one page transcript to his college because they didn't they didn't care. You know, it's an unselected yeah. college. So right. Yeah. So it just depends. It depends. It, it depends, but have it ready just in case. Have it ready. I, I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the counselor letter is really good to just highlight certain things about your student that maybe they don't highlight in their own application that you think is very important for colleges to know. And, you know, we've always done narrative. I did narrative with all my kids. Um, and it was important because like my oldest son had disabilities. He didn't do any dual enrollment at all. He, he just couldn't, you know, we, I had to explain that, especially we are in California. So many kids in California do dual enrollment. It was just too much for him. He had five years of high school. He needed that extra year. I mean, these type of things he didn't want to talk about too much in his own essays and everything, but I felt it was really important that schools know this so they know exactly the type of applicant he is. So hearing that AI is going to be reading these and kind of summarizing them, I think that's interesting. I think we need to keep our eyes on that because really what you're going to have to learn is how does AI summarize them? You know, how does it pick out things? So then are we going to start writing our counselor letters and then and guiding our parents for the, AI, putting it in the AI to see what it says. <laughs> yeah, that, that was exactly what I thought when I heard mm -hmm. that from Lee. I'm like, okay, maybe this is a next step I need to take. Maybe I need to not just give my feedback, but feed feed it through AI. But of course, you'd have to have a parent's permission, obviously, to right to right. do that. Maybe I would just encourage the parent to do it. So yeah, it's it's certainly something. It's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Things are changing. I think that's the big takeaway right now. Um, we just had a question. I'm going to pause our own stuff and go over this. There is someone saying that they always thought that testing was important for homeschoolers because it helps you get into college. You know, it's a way to validate. How does the test blind policies affect homeschoolers going forward since you can't even submit test scores? Um, oh, you know what? I'll address that. Um, okay. So I think, you know, just because I sit here in California where the University right. of California is test blind, Cal States are test blind, um, a school like WPI is test blind. So um, to answer that question, colleges have, uh, in, in the case of the University of California, they have a 13 point system for evaluation and it's very holistic. So if you if you want to Google that, you know, on your own, um, the person who asked the question, you can see. So they'll they'll look at, you know, they'll look at GPA, they'll look at um, and, you know, University of California looks at uh, uh, 10th and 11th grade GPA. They'll look at the courses, they'll look at the rigor. Um, they're going to look at your activities, your awards, your work. They're going to look at your circumstances. You know, did you face, um, you know, challenging circumstances? And all of those come out, of course, like in the University of California, they you have four PIQs, personal insight questions. Mm -hmm. And that's a chance for students to tell their story. But there's more even. There's also a 50 character box that you can explain about your educational background. There's also a 550 word additional information, which I always strongly recommend that homeschoolers use in every yeah. application. And that is one extra thing that I um, you know, tell all homeschoolers to use. Um, so because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting back to what Rick Clark said, it's all about context. Context, he said, context is king. So for those test blind, yeah. And, and the other thing is test blind schools will still see AP scores if you have them. They'll still see the fact that you've taken dual enrollment if you have. Um, so there are a lot of ways to, um, you know, contextualize an application without test scores. Um, so I think quite Frankly, I think they do a really good job. I'm, you know, I'm pretty impressed. Right. Yeah, this year with the UCs, I, you know, I'm not sure what's up. It's going to be really interesting. And, you know, my my mantra for the University of California is, you know, either love Merced, UC Merced, or expand <laughs> yeah, your yeah. list, you know, or expand your list because every other school is is going to be a mystery. But uh, I think the colleges are well prepared to, um, you know, evaluate 
um, you know, without a test score. But I agree to that for that listener to, I, you know, I still think if you can offer a test for those students who are applying to particularly more selective schools or obviously in states that require it, you know, yeah. um, you do need to, you know, prep and be prepared to submit, you know, a decent score. And we could spend time all the time in the world talking about talking test about scores that. and yeah. what's happened to the average test scores in a test optional world. But those right. are my thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else have thoughts? I mean, I would just say that, you know, other schools, the UCs are so transparent. It's really nice um, that you can see exactly that. Like they lay it out, those 13 points, but other schools are working with similar holistic points. Um, and, but also in terms of, you know, do homeschoolers really need a test score? Like I, sometimes, you know, we have a client and they take the test and it's a bomb and they try it again and it's a bomb. And this is a kid, sometimes these are kids who are making like, you know, A pluses in dual enrollment and they're clearly organized. They're doing fine. Like, and so I think you can't cry over something you just can't do. It, it, you know, if you if you don't have that option, you don't have that option. And isn't it great that now there are all these colleges where you have the ability to go, whether they're the test blind schools or the test optional schools. Um, and, you know, I don't, it, I think that context people sort of miss that it's you know, even for schools where they're looking at your test score, even for homeschoolers, it's just one of those points. It's just an added one. Um, and so it's not the be all end all. Like if you don't have course rigor and your kid has a, a 1550 on the SAT, they're still not going to get into like a super selective school because they want to see course rigor. Like they want to see all of those points that they're looking for. And so the test score isn't you know, maybe what it used to be, even when homeschoolers can get it. Even So it adds to you, like we definitely urge all of our clients to get a test score, but sometimes they don't end up submitting it anywhere. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Holly, what's your approach with that? Well, uh, very similar to everything you ladies have said. I don't know that I have anything particularly unique to add, except for the fact that, again, for me, it just goes back to a matter of timing. Very rarely at the point where kids are studying for and taking these standardized tests, very rarely is their college list set so that they know yeah. that they're only mm -hmm. applying to test blind schools, you know, un unless it is a California student who's only applying right. to you know, right. CSUs. So same thing. I encourage everybody to prepare, but as to whether we use the score, that's up for debate. I was, again, in the same conversation I'm thinking about with uh, Liam Daly of Beloit, he said something interesting in that regard that I, again, I don't think it holds true everywhere, but I found it interesting okay. for Beloit. <laughs> so let me say that. I don't want to okay, yeah. general advice. This is particular advice. And they're, they're test optional at Beloit. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, for homeschoolers, you know, it's purely test optional. He's very much an advocate. I don't want homeschoolers to feel like they have to jump through any other, ho any other hoops from any other applicant. They should be evaluated exactly the same. He was really adamant about that. But he also did say, however, you know, if they're thinking about submitting a score, a little bit lower score from a homeschooler is still helpful, which I thought was interesting. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I've you know, heard it that does too. help to validate, mm -hmm. validate the, the, the transcript. So I got the sense from him and he said it that, you know, even if it's not quite at the mid 50% mark for what Beloit's average is for a homeschooler, it probably could still help to submit even a little bit low. And I hesitate to even share that example because I yeah. think because it would absolutely hurt for you to yes. score that. Yes, really I was thinking that as you were saying that. Yeah. And particularly ones with very low admit rates. But that so might be like, a really interesting question to ask when we attend conferences or tours yes. or whatever, yes. you know, to yeah. really, if if you can get to the head of admissions or whatever, just, right. you know, would a below 50 percentile, you know, a little bit, you know, for a homeschooler, would that still be helpful for you? Because right, years ago, we had the subject test which personally I actually liked, you know, in a one hour test, I yes. thought those were pretty, pretty useful for homeschoolers. So I was a little glad to see those go away. But yeah. that that would be a really good question to ask other admissions officers. You know, what would you prefer to see from a homeschooler? 
Yeah, and if I could just give a yeah. shout out before we move on, and this is, sure. I, I guess, maybe a little self-congratulatory, but more congratulatory <laughs> toward all of you, and especially, Becca, toward your partner, Laura, over there in the California group. Uh, something I want homeschool parents to be aware of is even if you never hire a homeschool specialist, IEC, which all of us are independent educational consultant, even if you never hire us, you're still getting benefit from us. And I, I just want to make you aware of that in a way. And one thing I think it, we've really demonstrated our worth and our speaking voice is in this area of test optional admissions, because right. in COVID, when everybody went test optional, I mean, you ladies are on all the same admission list I am. Mm -hmm. you know, yet another school would chime up, we're test optional. And Laura or Becca or one of us would, you know, for homeschoolers too. And we yeah. asked that question consistently enough yeah. that I do think our efforts collectively have moved the needle on that conversation. So I just want parents to be aware of the fact that, you know, yes, parents, you have power in, in the process as well, but you also have, you know, there's a healthy, I don't know, a couple dozen of us probably who yeah. are professional yeah. homeschool specialists across the country. Yeah. Like you also are talking a and yes, yeah. you have a voice in advocating. Yeah. And, and sometimes because we're not directly tied to the applicant, uh, I, I feel like people listen a, a mm -hmm. little yeah. better. So, you know, yeah. just an encouragement that, uh, you know, don't feel bad if you can never afford to hire one of us because we're still doing good work on your on your behalf. I would add to that, too. All these groups are really helpful too. the California homeschool group that Becca does at our group. And I know there's a bunch of others. A lot of them are so helpful and we're jumping in and giving advice and everything. So there is support there for those who can't afford it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some one of the things that I found like when I talk to admissions uh, counselors like at colleges that, you know, sometimes I'm doing the role of educating them. <laughs> like I'm there to ask yeah. questions like, how do you treat this? How do you treat that? You know, and I find myself telling like I find myself <laughs> having to explain to them things and they're like oh I didn't know that like you know and I think they are taking it more seriously from us and this was particularly true during COVID when yes. you know when things were not available you know and, and it's still mm -hmm. that way you know in California maybe where you ladies sit with like AP exams you know mm -hmm. these schools don't think through the fact that you know homeschoolers have to jump through extra hoops yeah. for AP exam, for the PSAT, for um, SAT with accommodations that's school-based. So we have to, you know, you're absolutely right, Holly. We have had to educate a lot of colleges, you know, and I've pounded that pavement right in the CAC group. It's just like, no, we don't have access. How do you deal with that? And, you know, and then recently the question back to the parent documents for just a second about either, you know, listing test scores on those homeschool transcripts or not. You know, and I brought information over and had to bring the secondary information over because somebody, you know, there were people complaining, you know, we don't want to see a test scores on transcripts if that student ends up applying test optional because, you know, public schools can do that private school. Some schools right. just list test scores. And so, um, you know, trying, Holly's absolutely right. We're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. You know, we spend hours on this stuff just to make sure that you know, we're advocating right in this, you know, in this culture of, you know, access and equity, you know, I feel like our, you know, I'm advocating for that for my homeschool students as well. And it is I think that goes, shocking how many admission officers are unaware of the barriers, especially around AP tests for homeschoolers. Yeah. They don't know, which is why it's good to ex explain it to them. In the, why in the we have that additional information mm -hmm. in the paperwork, you know, yeah. that's why, I mean, because I, I can't remember, it. Rick Clark posted on Twitter and um, I don't remember what his comments were, but I, I followed up and just said, you know, uh, but context is important, you know, right? Rick and he said yeah <laughs> context is king I'm like I'm just confirming that it's really important to have these yes oh because I think oh I think the point was you know since the SCOTUS decision you know mm -hmm. and now we're sort of pinning everything on this 150 word essay so he right. was sort of minimizing the essay and I push back a little bit by saying but context is important and I actually work with homeschool students and he so he reaffirmed yes context is key so Holly like you said you know if they don't know that we don't have access to AP exams, 
you know, historically, sorry, I'm going back a, a ways, but, you know, years ago, Yale was, you know, decidedly pro AP and not pro, you know, dual enrollment. And it's like a school like that, you know, who arrogantly makes that decision without full knowledge, you know, needs to be educated and understand that not every homeschooler has access to AP scores. Yeah. So. And they're often really stuck, not even just public schools, but privates as well are often really stuck in their state context. So they want certain statewide documents or something. And I feel like that's, you know, I mean, this is this is why I have like uh, everybody put, you know, that they homeschooled according to their state law on the transcript, you know, and then also that like, you know, put those things in the profile, make it really clear. Like we, we didn't have access to this. We did have access to this. We didn't, you know, we weren't able to do this. Um, just so they know, because they don't know, they, they just, they don't know. You know, I would just jump in real quick too, and say for anyone who's homeschooling on a budget, who's low income or something, that's important to put into your documentation. Like if you can't afford AP coursework or you can't afford dual enrollment, mm -hmm. they need to know that, you know, and you were working within constraints. That's all part of, part of equity too. So that's really important. I just think it's important to say that because a lot of homeschoolers do have um, more resources sometimes, or it seems that way online, that you can homeschool with very little money and still get pretty good results for your students and everything. But also, that, Jill, um, that, yeah, I'm go ahead. I'm gonna just add to that point. That's, yeah. that's super interesting. I agree. Um, we did that before I was working full-time. You know, we were yeah. a single income. You know, Me, my husband yeah. was a UPS mm -hmm. driver. Um, yeah. And we actually received support from an outside organization for my two yeah. older children. And I, you know, I talked about that in our, you know, letter because, you know, they might wonder, well, how, how are they able to take, you know, lessons or, you know, take some of these classes? To, so, and I felt that that was a really important piece of information. So I agree with you. Again. And so we did QuestBridge. And in fact, that's very close to my heart and fair and on two students every year who uh, qualify for QuestBridge and we'll do everything for free for them. So if anyone is lower income that is listening to this, you can also reach out to us and we're, we always have spots for families in that situation. Um, okay, Farrah, are you okay? I, I know, I froze for a minute. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was we're, like, I know, I'm the host. It <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, what? Let's talk about... Um, one thing I want to just talk about briefly, does anyone think that test optional policies are going backwards for homeschoolers right now? Or do you think it's still pretty good? Mm, a little, I just think okay. It's confusing. I, I just yeah. think it's confusing for homeschoolers. And it's, you know, I know as professionals, you know, I see all of us asking these questions and parsing, you know, for this school, should I at this score? Or yeah. Whatever? You know, I just, think it you really need to dig into the data and unfortunately sometimes the colleges are not putting out as much of that data as I would like to see or the data they put out is difficult to parse so you might find a school where wow there really is this big disparity between students admitted with scores and students admitted without but you don't know well is the quality of the underlying applicant the same in the test optional and the test with test pile or do the test optional students also have lower rigor like i have no way of knowing that because the colleges aren't telling us so you know it's i don't know that it's going backwards i just find that it is a murky area and i, mm -hmm. I do think it's one that maybe uh Fair, like you were saying, I think we probably overemphasize it. Like if you've created your documents and your program well, there are going to be other evidences of rigor. So control what you can control. And certainly, right. certainly right. how you present yourself and your rigor is something you can control. But this is where I, you know, I do encourage, like, let's <laughs> let the admissions folks are there for a reason, you know, let's mm -hmm. try to get some answers. Let's try to get some, you know, so that it's not so opaque. So if you, you know, when in doubt, I encourage students and parents, contact yeah. admissions folks, ask them, you know, would you prefer to see a test score? I've had, you know, students ask, like, this is my test score, you know, should mm -hmm. I retake, should, you know, it doesn't, yeah, I know that a lot of students are so worried that they're going to, you know, jinx their application or whatever, but Right. You're not, you know, you really need to communicate. And and I will say the second thing um, is that right now, I think there's a bit, there's a bit uncertainty in all of higher ed with the SCOTUS decision. 
Um, right. So, you know, there's talk of, you know, more schools going test optional and all of that, you know, just in, in light of the SCOTUS decision. So, you know, right now I'm not changing my advice for this cycle. I just, I'm, I'm not prepared to do that, but, you know, obviously all of us are probably reading and, you know, hours a day on just right. different policies. And I think a lot of colleges don't know yet. Um, right. but, uh, you know, like you said, somebody just changed their policies last week, yep. right? So I think colleges right now here, end of July, uh, beginning of August are, you know, updating policies. So I, I think we just have to sort of be aware and when in doubt, contact email call. <laughs> I think I just want to pop in real quick and say that I absolutely tell all my families and the kids too, especially that are applying, don't be afraid to reach out to admissions. They love to hear from you. And then they kind of start getting to know you a little bit. It can't hurt. I think it's a really good policy and parents can reach out when it's specific about paperwork or, you know, they need to contact financial aid office or anything like that. But students reaching out is always a good thing, I think. Um, Farah, do you have any thoughts? I like um, I, I mean, I off. was just going to, oh, did I? <laughs> no, I was just going to say that it's, it, it's not just complex for homeschoolers. It's, it's just gotten messy for everyone. And the, yes. the SCOTUS decision, you know, I don't think on the ground, it's not going to, no matter where you stand on it, like good or bad, like it's just not going to change much for your kid and their options. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, you know, some people cheered and other people despaired and, but the reality is it's not you know, for most students, there's just going to be no impact in their admission chances. The impact is going to be on, are they going to have to answer additional supplemental questions and are testing policies going to shift a little bit again? And that's the impact that, that families are likely to see, that students are likely to see. Yeah. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to talk about real quick, uh, someone was asking about um, the best preparation in high school for homeschool college admissions. Is any, that's a pretty general question. And what is everyone's thoughts on that? How do you advise? Does I don't know, Farrah and I will work with students from seventh or eighth grade on and help them plan each year. I don't know if everyone does that here, but so we have very specific ways that we help. What does everyone else do? Um, Holly, what do you do? Well, you know, I get people all throughout the process. So my mm -hmm. advice depends on when they come to me. <laughs> right. right. So you come to me and you're like coming into ninth grade, we are going to have a super robust discussion about what a college prep uh, experience looks like. And that's not cut and dried and it's not the same for every person, but there are some markers, right? So, you know, if you tell me your kid wants to stop math after geometry, we're going to have a discussion about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I want you to really fully understand the number of doors that will be closed to you as a result of that decision. Now, does that mean everybody has to do higher math and do it all at the same level and, at, you know, using some magic curriculum? No, of, of course it doesn't mean that. But right. you know, if I get someone early, I am going to advise them, hey, you know, if you want to keep the most doors open, you want the five core subjects across all four years, five by four is going to really serve you well. But that's not every student. And sometimes they have uh, interests that are very pointy in certain uh -huh. areas, really want the time to pursue. That's great, too. So a lot of times the conversation then becomes, well, how do we creatively fulfill this in a way that colleges will understand, or at least we can phrase it in a way that colleges will understand, but you can also do what you wanna do. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of nuance in there, but then I get a lot of people who come to me toward sort of toward the end of their junior year. Yeah. And that, that, that ship has sailed. That, <laughs> That has, that has been gone. And that, you know, I turn into an investigator, I think, at that point. So I had, you know, just an example. I had a client last cycle who actually graduated early and then came to me. Uh, had I spoken to that person before they graduated early, I probably would not have advised them to graduate early. There were some gaps. Yeah. So <laughs> then they had to, you know, they had to do a little bit during their gap year and it couldn't be transcripted. The transcript was done and final and they had actually done some charter work. So, you know, they, the parent didn't have the ability to really all that. 
but they could add in the things that were gaps on their own and explain that in additional information. So we did that. So for me, you know, how to plan to have a successful experience is think broadly. Lots of things can fill that science, social studies, language, yeah. art, math, and uh, mm -hmm. world language requirements. You can do that an in infinite variety of ways. But I think to ignore that across four years, you just have to understand it's it's your life, it's your education, do what you want. Uh, but some doors will not be open to doors you. closed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, um I liked okay. what you said about being an investigator. I feel like one of the first things, especially when we get um when Jill and I get a client who is like maybe 10th grade, 11th grade at the start, it, she'll be like, and talk to me, is there anything you studied on your own? <laughs> because one of my first it, questions. <laughs> I know, because it's, it, we want to find those things that kids are, are doing anyway. And sometimes it turns out, well, I just read this giant stack of books about genetics for fun. Like, you know, and then it's like, guess what? We're going to give you a half credit in genetics, you know? So it, it I think like, you know, I, I like the pointy kids. I think that, um, mm -hmm. you know, not all kids are and having a well-rounded education is good, but I think to stay, don't try to look like everyone else is the sure. biggest thing. Like, you know, I think it's good to get that, um, you know, that, that four by five, you know, four by four or five by four, like of all of your cores every year, but, um, it, mix it up a little bit. And I, Jill and I have worked with students who did not do a third, uh, or sorry, a fourth science or social studies, depending right. on which direction they were heading, who did fine, sometimes very well, because they used that to make room to do a lot more, you know? So I think it's like a, what are you, what's the trade-off? Like, you know, you can't not do the things, but, you know, you can, you know, what, if you don't do something, are you trading it for something that's especially something that's second level coursework that's better? And so I think aiming to do those types of things, that's important. Um, that's Parents need question. to understand the trade-off. That, that's, yes. that, yeah. I, think my, they decide. The trade -off. I advise they decide, but I want them to understand <laughs> the trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think this is what homeschooling is so good for because as a parent you control so much so you can do some students can do you know it can be a little different than public school students or private school students and you can present them in a certain way that looks good to admissions so i think that homeschooling that one thing that parents forget a lot of times is there are benefits to homeschooling when it comes to college admissions and controlling the paperwork is one of those benefits i think and it helps for these kids who maybe are really pointy um it's, in a, it's way. a benefit if you do things that are worth reading about like it's it's a benefit and if you, if you provide that information and you right if you can it's a benefit if you organize it well and provide the information and mm -hmm. if you did things that were interesting to look at like if you did courses that are like wow that's interesting like oh there's like a whole book list with that like oh that you know then you got something and that is a way of showing rigor um those course descriptions and contextualizing so um becca how do you approach that with your clients um so because i'm in california i actually sort of use the a through g model for mm -hmm. all my students because i think there's a minimum uh, number of courses so if, if the listeners out there are not from california still it might be fun for you to look it up so it, it is a mm -hmm. minimum it's a, a 15 courses minimum um, and it touches all the subject areas, including performing and visual arts and then advanced coursework. So that's, you know, that's usually where I start. I just want to check certain boxes, like make sure that you have world history in some form, U.S. history in some form, yeah. et cetera, a minimum of two years of foreign language. And I'm usually an outlier when it comes to foreign language because my own children did not do <laughs> four years. Um, and my, then, mine didn't either, too. Right. I, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my they middle son. Yeah. yeah, my middle son had literally one semester of community college Italian, which here in California is two years of high school foreign language. Um, and that was it. And he hated yeah, it. it two years and he was going to go a, a third year and he wanted to take animation instead at the same time. Um, and so I said, you know what, to heck with it. Let's just let the chips fall where we may. So I'm very much a, an unschooling, self-directed type homeschool, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> advisor. However, having said that, if there are anomalies, again, 
there needs to be context. So in the case of mm -hmm. my son, we used the fact that he had a hearing loss. He had to have ear surgery and yeah. a PE tube inserted and all of that. So we kind of use that as an excuse for why he didn't start foreign language till his senior year. Yeah. So, um, you know, context is important. Um, so, you know, my eldest son was very pointy, but we made sure that we checked the minimum boxes. Like he wasn't interested in history or biology or chemistry, but we still covered it in a very unschoolish way. So I agree with Jill that, you know, homeschooling allows you that flexibility to, you know, sort of unschool home, you know, self-directed, you know, home design stuff where you're just not that excited if you want, you know, or on the other hand, if you're super excited and those home design right. courses are all over the place, you know? So yeah, I would say, you know, meet the bare minimum. Again, know, you know, know what the schools that you're applying to are looking for. And then you do, you know, if, if kids, you know, if you're listening and you're starting in senior year, you can just still actually adjust your senior year schedule to mm -hmm. check a few of the boxes that might be missing, you know, so it's, you know, until you actually graduate, like in the case of that student, Holly, you know, it's, it's not a done deal, you know, dual enrollment, self-designed, you know, courses, whatever. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm more flexible, I guess, just because of my own personal philosophy and people who work with me, we, they know that <laughs> they know that yeah. I have a real self-directed bent. Um, yeah. Because I love homeschooling and, and being able to pursue what you love and making that unique, making your kids, you know, stand out because they've been able to pursue what they love. Because that's one of the reasons you homeschool, isn't it? Yeah. To yeah, do that. Like, don't forget. Don't forget why you were. Don't forget why you homeschooled. Yeah. Um, I think it's helpful, too, if you I don't know if everyone homeschooled all their kids or just a few, but I homeschooled all three of mine. They were very different from each other. <laughs> in huge ways, you know, and so I had to figure out how to present all of them in their unique way. Some were pointy, some were very general with a great test score. It, it all works, you know, it, homeschooling works for a lot of different students with different backgrounds and goals and everything. Context is so important in just figuring out how to present them. And, and I, you know, and I know that we're just about out of time, but I would say, you know, uh, parents who are listening, you know, don't compare your child to anyone else. I think Jill, yes. Jill and I both had very similar experiences. I have, mm -hmm. you know, yes, I homeschooled all the way through, you know, my eldest son was ex extraordinarily academic and, you know, yeah. went to MIT and all of that. And my middle son was academic, but 2E, uh, he went to an Ivy League, came home, just it was it was not a good fit. And and then my third son is not academic at all. He's going to a local Christian college, you know, um, so I had to, you know, do something very different. And I didn't compare them, you know, and it was, and it's an adjustment. Parents, that's, you know, if you have multiple <laughs> children, you really have to like keep adjusting your expectations, you know, for each child. Um, but, and then just kind of, you know, tune out the noise that says the shoulds. Um, yeah. I just wrote about that. Uh, Brendan Bernard had an amazing article about the should, uh, the tyranny of college admissions. I, you know, I recommend oh, I everybody one. go look, yeah. look for that yeah. because, you know, yes, there are some shoulds like Holly mentioned, you know, yes, you, you should have, you know, X number of uh -huh. math, English, et cetera. But beyond that, you know, do what makes sense for your family and then adjust, you know, adjust the college list to fit who you are. That's what I always tell my families, adjust the college list to who you are. Don't change the number to try to fit the college. I tell parents all the time, and I say it in all our videos, is homeschool with blinders on. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to do that. Don't worry about what everyone else is doing. There's a reason you homeschooled. There's a reason that works for your student. Just keep reminding yourself that. And if you have more than one kid, don't compare them. And uh, Farrah and I both had twins to start with. <laughs> it's hard I not try, to compare them sometimes. But mine are really different too. I mine are I mean, different too. I think the homeschool with blinders on thing, that's also with testing and that's with the coursework that your kid gets through. That's the whole thing. I like what you're saying, Becca, about like, you know, you, you choose the list to fit the kid. You don't make the kid fit some preconceived idea of the list. That's not how that is. Right. Any last thoughts? Because we're out of time. Anyone want to add anything? Close with anything? Feel free. This was fun. This we was can do it again. Super fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we should fun. do it again. Let's do it next yeah, year. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll plan it again. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. For anyone watching, the recording will be available in our group. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye. everybody.